Greetings everyone, here we are with another delightful video. This time it's going to be covering uh, Hole of the Wild for Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster. <coughs> Occasionally, please note that uh, sometimes there is this weird quirk issue with Pathfinder 2nd Edition where some of the products uh, don't have a clear indication if it was originally designed in for Pathfinder 2nd Edition Legacy or Classic, or Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster, which is sort of Pathfinder 2.1, 2.2 Edition. Uh, but anyways, uh, the most common thing you can tell on the cover of the book, if it's not shrink-wrapped or anything like that, is that the corner box out will be green with a just slightly off yellow text. Where the cla the <clears throat> brain fart for five seconds. <coughs> Pathfinder <coughs> second edition classic will have a orange box out with like reddish or maroon text in it, and that's usually the most that's the basic one that's the most common to most products. However, there are on occasions where Paizo kind of mixes that up. Uh, and you'll have the regular, the classic box out in the corner be the, yeah, be the classic box out in the corner here uh, for the second edition remaster. Uh, the surefire way, the surefire way of confirming whether it is a Pathfinder second edition classic or a Pathfinder second edition remaster is if you go to the back end of the book, if it's not wrapped up or anything, and you can physically get your hands on the book, you will have the OGL license for Classic Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And for Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster, or Pathfinder 2.2 .2 or 2.1, uh, you'll have the Orc Notice right here. And that will be your indicator that that is a Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster product. <clears throat> so, here we go. Uh, Pathfinder... 2nd Edition Remaster, Howl of the Wild. Uh, this is a nice hardcover book. Uh, it, MSRP is for $64.99. Uh, it is not a particularly thick book for $64.99. However, I do say that there is a good amount of artwork in this book, and there's actually pretty good writing. There's always the classic issue with Pathfinder products that occasionally have some mis uh, grammar issues or... Uh, or having to be re eroded a few times and so the so uh, spelling is corrected. <coughs> Exceedingly common problem I seem to come across for Path uh, Paizo products is oftentimes there'll be uh, grammar issues and spelling issues for some words. Uh, you have a nice uh, glaring overworld map. I do believe this is specifically for some other part of the world I cannot my brain is not... Oh, now I, I, I had to look for the inner sea to know exactly where something is. Uh, that's the inner sea region. This is the entire world of Galarian. I'm having like a mental fart like, okay, the vast majority of Pathfinder 2nd Edition adventures usually occurs in this region of the world. There's very few over here. This is Tian Zhao, which is basically Asia. And this continent right here is basically the Americas. This is Africa, and this is uh, Europe type uh, world. Interestingly enough, Europe in the uh, in real world is a really tiny region of the world that is excluding Russia is only slightly bigger than the United States. If you take all of Europe, I mean like all of it, all the way from like. Uh, Portugal all the way over or to the border of Russia with Ukraine. Europe is just barely bigger than the United States. You throw Canada into the United States versus uh, versus uh, United States and Canada versus Europe. Europe is irrelevantly small. But anyways, I do love the little uh, fanciful aquatic creatures particularly uh, sea serpents and like dragon 
uh, turtle fish or something like that. And other sea serpent, the giant and, uh, krakens. But the basic premise of this book is that this is an adventuring uh, group going around the world to study various other uh, wild beasts. And uh, they're all beast-like humanoids. <coughs> this book is... A weird that pies that pies a weird blend of in world book and mechanical book, and I really wish that Paizo would stop uh, teetering on that gray zone, that uh, edge between the two, because it leads to some of their books being really messed up and hard to use. Because they're so poorly organized, or, or stuff is spread out across the book in such irrational messed up ways that it actually is a pain in the ass to even like even go into the book uh the dark archive is like literally the worst book to try to find something in you are literally smarter and better off to go to archives of nethys or pf2 easy than even consider looking through the dark archive book because even then you're essentially having it's like three smaller books smashed together and all the stuff is spread through the entire book. So, and you have to just basically bounce back and forth between the table of contents and the index and glossary in the back just to uh, find roughly where you need to find the stuff. And you just can page through the book and discover entire new things months or a year later or that you didn't realize was in there because it's just a little blurb shoved into a corner or something. But anyways... Uh, this is the table of contents. It is actually fairly well laid out. I hope this is a trend that's going forward with Paizo that they put a little more effort into their table of contents and indexes. Because if they really want to go down the crazy territory of having a book that's a blend of in-world and, and uh, game, uh, game mechanics... Uh, they really need to work heavily on improving uh, findability of uh, documentation of all the information in the book, in the uh, table of contents and uh, index. But anyways, as a in-world section of the book, there's this book, this go forward as if it's written from the character in the book. So there you go. You have this nice little column on the side here. Uh, this is kind of variable in, as you can see here, it changes length as it's based on what section of the book you are in. So it will drop down other sections or other uh, areas in the book as you go through it. So this basically talks about the ship they're traveling on around the world <laughs> and the various other people. And this gives you the new ancestries right here. Gives you rules on dealing with large PCs or player characters or tiny player characters. How to deal with uh, player character uh, riding player characters like the centaur, or where you can actually have other player characters ride them, aquatic player characters, flying player characters, and so forth. And then it goes over the characters on the ship. So. You have a nice variety of characters here. Uh, please note that I find this... This is sort of a weird meta thing. Uh, as you can see that it's like a ship of like one of each species or ancestry on the ship. Uh, most typical people... The most people who just are like paging through things, not thinking about it... Uh, will not notice or obsess about literally a group of literally one of each thing on a ship. But it's weirdly enough a, mir a weird mirror problem of one group to another group. But anyways, uh, it is weird to just have like one person of each species on a thing. Like it's like parceled out like representation. And that's just bizarre. Uh, I would naturally think that there would be some humans mixed in there or some other, other people. Maybe like 
two or three of something thing like maybe there's a few elves going on adventures with them as well but anyways you would not think it would literally be just one of each thing so this is the next section we have each ancestry nice little blurb section about explaining the ancestry their history the uh, common characteristics they have the beliefs of basically their religions uh, these are your traits for the ancestry. It's rarity, hit points, size, speed, attributes, uh, attribute flaw. Some of them have attribute flaws. Paizo is still doing the attribute flaws, which is perfectly fine by me, but it bothers some people. Languages, traits, and uh, any special characteristics such as like dark vision, low light, uh, uh, bulky form, uh, intangible, things like that. Uh, in the case of this fish species, we have low light vision. And then we go to the next page and it goes over the different heritages of the species in itself, which is actually rather nice. There is actually a really nice variety of fish species and they give you enough options here. The options they give here are basically... Are you coral related, open ocean, deep ocean, or like streams and stuff like that? So basically you can flavor whatever species of fish you want as long as you roughly know where that fish originated from and what uh, heritage you can work that into. You have your various uh, feats for that, for your fish species, uh, humanoid fish people. Yet again, nice variety of, of form and factor. And then we have awakened animals. And same pattern as before. You got a bear person now. You can have uh, dog people. You can have turtle people. You can have... Uh, uh, I'm having a brain for five seconds here. Monkey people. Uh, chimpanzee people. Uh, cat people that are not uh, cat folk. Uh, these are just awakened animals. A giraffe. You can have a giraffe riding in a carriage being pulled by a bunch of humans. Stuff like that. Uh, that's a Futurama joke, by the way. But anyways, all the ancestors, or all the heritages are basically climbing, flying, running, which is basically like a cheetah or uh, antelope or something like that. Or swimming animal, which overlaps with the fish, but you can, as you can see, you can have Ugwe right here, except he's not a tortoise, he is actually a sea turtle. You have uh, you know, some bird people, some elk people. <coughs> you have the feats, you have animal attack table right here. So you can actually uh, engineer in, like, using your antlers or various talons or a tongue if you got like a frog person that you don't want to like use a grong or something else like that or a gripply you have that option and then we have centaurs right here as i said before uh down here you have multiple traits you have dark vision mount and robust which basically robust functions as basically uh, i forgot the name of for it for dungeon and dragon 5th edition but it's basically uh Allowing you to be treated as if you are a size bigger than you actually are. Incidentally, uh, centaur size is actually large. So yeah, you actually got an actual large centaur. You got a variety of things. Here. You got different types of centaurs. A good variety as well as lore. So if you want to play a centaur or a pony girl, go for it. There's pony girls. There's also mermaids here. And you have the various different types of mermaids. Yet again, just like the fish people. They're basically based around, are you the mermaid from the deep seas? Are you the mermaid from the Arctic? Are you a mermaid from like the tropical regions of the world? And so forth. You got abyssal mermaids. Cochedron, a car, chardron merfolk. Plagic merfolk and reef merfolk. So you have the classic. You got 
uh, him, and then you also have the abyssal right here, which basically is deep sea. And also, there's sailfish option too. I think he's based off of a shark, probably like a great white. So you have a few others, and you got a chariot for your merfolk just in case you're on land, because they only have five foot moving speed on land. And then you have minotaurs, which are actually are large size, by the way. Various different types of minotaurs, as well as various feats for various minotaurs. That is actually a piece of artwork that's been reused from an older Pathfinder product. I can tell that I can, that can recognize the style difference. And then you have bug people. And the bug people are actually kind of really interesting because they consume magic. And they have an innate magic characteristic tied to them. So they can uh, basically change the, uh, whatever magic they consumed a lot as a larva. Basically becomes their default school. They had different uh, heritages based on, on how they're, they reacted to magic consumption as a larva and growing into adult. <coughs> Your standard feats. So you can have like beetle people and ant people and all kinds of stuff out of that. Um, kind of out of that. There's a cat person that I don't think is a cat folk. Uh, which is kind of the weird thing. Uh, yet again, this is going into basically like the in-world setting thing, book thing going right here. And then they go back to this. Uh, and Paizo seems to be getting better about doing in-world and mixing it with uh, set uh, mechanics. However, they still kind of uh, rub up the edge on that on occasion. As I said before, the Dark Eye Cavity is literally the worst book of the bunch. Uh, this section right here has new witch feats. And then there's also some Barbarian and Bard and so many others. There's also some uh, other fun feats for various archetypes like Beastmaster, the new type, the new one, Claw Dancer. I think that actually might actually be reused artwork right there. Uh, Ostili Host. Swarm Keeper Archetype. Telephant Cons... Okay, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy ass word. I can't uh, work out. There's like a limit for someone to be able to pronounce certain things. Uh, wear Creature Archetype. Feats basically for giving turning your character into a were creature. Wild Mimic. Winged Warrior. And then we have some spell new spells for your characters. Uh, for different uh, classes and so forth. Another in-world section. You can tell the in-world book sections by a basically the tarot page age effect on it. And new animal companions for your characters. You got some really new action options. You got some grafts, so you can uh, graft wings onto your barbarian uh, or your wizard or whatever you want. Uh, I should really read into that and wonder where they are getting those appendages from, like gills and cl slashing claws, like wolverine in your arm or tail. Yeah, so I wonder where you're getting those from. Beast armor and beast armaments. So basically weapons made from body parts of various creatures. Uh, that's rather interesting in itself. And then you have alchemical items in here. Adventuring gear. Big game siege weapons. So do you want a blob paste propulsor or aquatic disintegrator or... Uh, Kickback Spring. There you go. So you got new weaponry to mount to ships. And then we are going into the new creature section. Uh, creature adjustments. This basically is basically the new... Uh, basically the basically the basically the basically. Yes, I said it basically a bunch of times. So I make fun of myself by repeating myself over there. Uh, but anyways, these are the creature adjustments section which is standard with pretty much all the bestiary and monster core books. 
<clears throat> for adjusting up and down your uh, power levels of your creatures, but also adding extra features into your creatures for combat. So you have a whole new section on an Apothecary Bee and an Emdret and a few other things. Uh, a to Z. And you have these nice little tear-out sections basically with uh, actual ecology information on the morphology of various uh, uh, b uh, creatures and their habitats and the history of them and so forth. And you have, it's just really nice. Uh, advice on creating new chimeras and having different heads and what kind of abilities each head would grant your chimera. So if you can actually build your own chimera now with all the different body parts, that's actually a really nice is feature. Crying Cicada. Uh, some more dinosaurs for our dinosaur friends and so forth. And then you may have some legendary creatures in here as well. Uh, every so often you'll get a really interesting little ter uh, bonus section on talking about a specific creature. But towards the back here, as we go further back, this is another section on uh, hydras. Uh, two, uh, three new hydras right here. As we go back. And then there's a few more hydras. You cannot have enough hydras. A starfish creature and so forth. Information on manticore and so forth. Mostly beasts and beast like creatures in this book. New were creatures. And then we have these new. This is a section on like four legendary creatures. And uh, each one of these creatures has one of these tarot pages Warden of the Caverns and Burrows. Which is basically kind of like a gigantic insect crawfish hybrid. Or some kind of crawfish insectoid. Warden of the Forest and Meadows. Warden of the Oceans and Rivers. Which is a, I think that's a sea angel. Warden of the Peaks and Skies, a four winged bird. And then more stuff on the adventures, as well as the ability glossary back here. Creatures by level list, which is really nice. Uh, glossary and index for uh, traits. Which goes actually for a few pages. A map of the ship. Your orc notice, your piezo uh, listing for all the different people working on the staff. And an advertisement down here. Also, there's this mysterious continent down here that has no details on it. Interesting. But anyways, I do say that this book is actually quite nice. And they seem to have corrected that weird quirk of mishmashing shing like essentially multiple different books together. And then doing the insetting thing and... Uh, spreading everything out through the entire book uh, in a nonsensical mess. Uh, so they haven't done that, but they still retain some of the in-world feel, which is really nice. I actually do like the fact that they dialed back the in-world feel and still managed to maintain the good parts of that while keeping a strong focus on usability of the book. Uh Overall, I really do like this book. This is a good book for when your party wants to be more like a beast uh, party. Uh, my only side issue is that this book is, for the size of it, is $64.99 in price. And that uh, starts becoming rather restrictive to various people to purchase this book. So unless you specifically want to have the lore information around uh, minotaurs, centaurs, mermaids, uh, lizard folk, uh, awakened animals, and so forth for Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster. Uh, you probably are in the territory of not buying this book unless you want that stuff. Brain fart that. 
if you really want that stuff, you probably could go ahead and buy this book. Uh, but it's getting prohibitive in cost for people at that point. And then uh, if it doesn't really matter to you so much that uh, you don't have that information, you pretty much just can go with Archives of Nethys and uh, Path Builder 2E. So there's that. Uh, overall, since I rate, put my scores on products and scale them to the price of the product, considering that this is $64.99, uh, this is actually getting to the territory of being a 3.5 star or 3.25 star. As the higher price and the smaller book uh, starts degrading the value of the book itself. Because you're paying a lot of money for, very, uh, for fewer pages. So... It, at this, at a certain point, Paizo is going to run into a situation where people, uh, the pay, the price keeps going up, the pages keep going down, and the people are gonna like, I'm just gonna use Path Builder, and I'm gonna look up the lore that is important to me on YouTube or various other websites like wikis, and uh, go from there. Uh, the nice advantage of a book. I do say I, why I would still buy these stuff besides doing the YouTube channel is simply because I like to have physical copies just in case there's no power. I grew up poor, so the concept of living weeks or months without electricity is not an alien concept to me. So uh, I would much rather have the ability in case of no electricity, being able to sit down and read a book while I'm cooking a steak or something on a fire, that's a big plus. So, but anyways, this is basically a 3.5. If it was a $59.99 or a $49.99, I do say this is probably like the size of a book that should be like $49.99. Uh, it would be closer to uh, four stars. But as the price goes up and the page uh, pages go down and uh, the sheer amount of information and mechanics goes down with the page number, uh, the harder it is to rate a product higher on that scale. So there you go. I do, do say that if you really care about lore information about characters and you want a physical copy of something i do recommend this but this is getting in the territory of like you should go and go to the absalom archive here on youtube or sir vertigo or a few other pathfinder second edition content creators that do cover a lot more lore on the system and follow them and then just use Path Builder and look stuff up on Archives of Nethys for mechanics. So, there you go. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more of these Pathfinder 2nd Edition uh, videos, the remaster and the classic, or even Pathfinder, or, uh, the original Pathfinder 2nd, uh, original Pathfinder, which is 1st Edition, uh, or Starfinder 1st Edition, or Starfinder 2nd Edition, or any of that stuff, uh, go to the section below this video, hit the like button and subscribe, and then go watch a bunch of those other short uh, videos and shorts, and leave likes on those as well. If you want more of something, watch them, like them, and subscribe, okay? I do keep track of the, pro, uh, blah, blah, blah. the polls on the community section as well. Even the really old ones way down, I scroll way down and see if there's any changes. If there's changes, I denote them and uh, I make a point of buying more of that product line and putting it into my pile. Uh, there you go. So thank you very much for watching. Have a delightful day, a nice night, a wonderful weekend, a magnificent month, and see you next time. Ciao.